presentation will be Alma Leopold, Prairie Chickens and Grassland Conservation, Looking Back and Looking Forward. Dr. Miney is a conservation biologist and writer based in Sauk County. He serves as senior fellow with the Aldo Leopold Foundation in Baraboo and the Chicago-based Center for Humans and Nature, as research associate with the International Crane Foundation and as adjunct pro assist associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He served as on-screen guide in the Emmy Award-winning documentary film Green Fire, Aldo Leopold, and A Land Ethic for Our Time in 2011. Dr. Miney has authored and edited several books, including the award-winning biography, Aldo Leopold, His Life and Work, 2010, and A Driftless Reader, 2017. In his home landscape, he is a founding member of the Sauk Prairie Conservation Alliance. It's with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce Dr. Kurt Miney. Come forward if you Yes, can. please come forward. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Thank you so much. I didn't finish my dessert. So I'm going to put it over on this table. This is an incentive for me not to talk too much. That'll, that'll encourage me to be efficient. Uh, let me encourage you, yes, as you finish uh, having your lunch, to join us up front because, uh, first of all, it's very light in the room. and be able to see the slides so well, perhaps. Can I bring it forward? No, that won't work. <laughs> Better to bring you forward than the screen. That'll just be a mess. Um, so please come forward. Also, because uh, uh, the screen is pretty small, so um, I will start slowly. That way you can finish eating. And you can rush to the front. How's that? The other thing I must do is put my coffee down and get my notes. Bear with me. Okay. So, well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm going to riff a little bit while you eat uh, by, first of all, saying thank you to, uh, to the whole group up here. You know, I've done a lot of talks in the last few months. When you agree to do a talk, you never know what you're getting into. You never know if you're going to have to work really hard or the group will make it easy. And one thing you do over the years is you realize which groups have their act together and which don't. This group totally has its act together. So to all of you who have organized not only today but all the related field trips and stuff, thank you so much. You plainly are at the very tip top of the list of people who invited me to speak to uh, I need my clicker. So, even if you're in the back of the room, you can see this. You can see in the square are three people. On the left is Aldo Leopold. In the center is Frederick Hammerstrom. On the right is Francis Hammerstrom. <laughs> How many of you in this room knew the Hammersmiths? Wow. So I could quit my talk right now. And we could tell Hammersmith stories for the rest of the afternoon. So I will, while you're again finishing lunch, riff a little and tell one story. And uh, because I knew it would be a crowd that would, this would mean something too. I don't know if you ever have a gathering where you have as many people who knew the Hammersmiths. I was a kid, I was a student in Madison when I met Fred and Fran, came up to interview them and spend time talking with them. But I'll tell you the quick story. This is a story about my cousin, who at the time was living in New York City. She was in her 20s. She was going through a life crisis. She was having all kinds of personal problems. So she begged me to come out to Wisconsin so she could get out of New York City. I said, sure, come on out. And while she was here doing rehab in my living room, we decided to take a trip up north and came up Highway 51. As I was getting closer to Stevens, I said, you know, let me call a friend of mine and see if she might be willing to entertain visitors. So I stopped right up 
off the highway in West in uh, Plainfield, in a uh, place to call this pre-cell phone time. And I called out of the blue friend and said, hey, friend, what are you doing? You mind having some visitors? She said, oh, come on over. So we go over there. I told my cousin nothing about what we were going to do. <laughs> I just said, here's a friend that you will enjoy meeting. So we go over there. And all of you could tell these variations on the story, right? Of Fran serving you pie with crust made up bag grease, or of Porforio flying through the living room, her owl. So I didn't, I didn't tell my cousin anything. I said, just you're gonna enjoy this. So we went there. Fran was still in her morning robe, I think, when we got there. <coughs> And I introduced her to my cousin. I said, this is my cousin Alexis. She lives in New York City. And Fran says, New York City? That's great. I'm going to be there this week. And you can help me. <laughs> you have to know my cousin. My cousin is quite an attractive young woman. And, and very stylish in New York City. She says, you can help me pick out my dress when I'm going to be on the David Letterman show. Oh. <laughs> Alexis, my cousin's like, where am I? Who is this person? <laughs> Fran was getting ready to go on the Letterman show to tout her book, uh, uh, which one was it? It was the Wild Game Cookbook, wow. which is right over here. And so I think, I, there, yeah, there, there, let's see. So, her, Fran proceeds to go up and down the stairs, and she, every time she'd come down with a different dress. No. <laughs> and she'd kind of do a little, you know, she was a model in her, young, in her younger years, and she'd come down and do her modeling thing. And she said, what do you think of this one? And my cousin is like, well, should I be serious about this? I guess so. And my cousin's being very serious again. Finally, she says, I think that second one is the one to go. Fran says, I thought so too. That's the one I was going to use. This, so this plays out, and the owl portfolio flies through the room just on cue, and, and my cousin is like freaking out. <laughs> but she's laughing too. And finally, I said, Fran, we gotta go, we gotta get up north. We leave the room, we get back on the road, and my cousin looks at me, she says, What the hell was that? <laughs> I said, That's Fran. So we all have our stories. I love this photo, particularly, and if you come up close, you'll be able to see it better. Because it shows them when they were students of Aldo Leopold. And what you see is Aldo looking kind of like, mm hmm And there's Fred. And if you look at Fred, he's kind of standing like this with a cigarette in his hand. What he's doing is imitating Aldo Leopold. This was Aldo Leopold's customary stance. So it tells me, this photo tells me that, first of all, everyone had a sense of humor. Second, Aldo was not hung up on his own ego. And third, his students had fun with the professor, the famous Aldo Leopold. They got along and had a good time together. I imagine this photo was taken not far from where we are. I don't know the exact story behind it. So, what I'm going to do is talk about the things in the title, Leopold Prairie Chickens and Grassland Conservation. This was a fun thing to dip into back into my history and into the archives, so there's going to be a lot of historical stuff here. That's why if you want to come forward, you'll see more details. Um, and uh, the bottom line on this particular talk is that Boy, there's a lot of things about prairie chickens in the archives at the University of Wisconsin in Aldo Leopold's papers. And I'll tell you more about that. Um, because it turns out that prairie chickens, above all, provide this really amazing thread to trace the history of Leopold, of conservation in Wisconsin, to trace the history of wildlife science. And I'll, I'll help illustrate that in what I show you. Let's start here. So, I also kind of added on a little bit because this year is the 70th anniversary of Aldo Leopold's book, A Sand County Almanac, being published. So I just gave a talk down in Madison on this a couple weeks ago. In fact, I'm going to encourage you, because you are a core audience. If you get down to Madison sometime in the next month, 
make a special detour and go to the Memorial Library, the main library on the campus at the UW, go up to the very top floor, which is the ninth floor, which is called the Department of Special Collections. It's where they hold rare books and archival material and all kinds of really fascinating things. They have right now the first ever special exhibit on all the Leopold's archival resources. It's a really great piece of museum work and, and you would really enjoy seeing how they put it together. So I'll just make that pitch. Um, and it was prepared to match this 70th anniversary year. So, I'm not going to do a big Leopold talk. I'll do a little bit of biography, but I want to kind of cut to the chase. But I did want to touch on one early episode because this, again, and being invited to do this talk gave me a lot of uh, chance to do retrospection. So here's Leopold as a kid, as an infant. He's up there. Let's see if I got this right. He's up there in the upper left in that photo. This is his childhood home along the Mississippi River in Burlington, Iowa, southeast Iowa. If you're ever down there, you can visit this house now and see it. And I'm only going to do this early biographical stuff for one reason. Let's do highlight this guy. This is Aldo Leopold's father. He was Aldo as a kid, was one of his early drawings. This is Carl, his father. Carl was a really important influence, on, obviously, on Leopold. He was a very enthusiastic hunter, but he was also a very conscientious hunter, a real pioneer in conservation, as Aldo himself called it. This is when, how to tell this story, I've never told this story before. What you see on the left, on the right there is a letter. Way, 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 way back when I was a student starting my research on my PhD on Aldo Leopold, this is the very first letter I read. It's the first letter in the collection of archival material related to Aldo Leopold. It's dated 1878. You can't quite see it, but that's up there in the corner. Look. And I'll read it for you, because I know you can't read it, and even, that, even if you were up close, you probably couldn't read it, because you had to get used to reading the writing of the 1800s. I have been chicken shooting twice, and had quite a good time, good bit of sport. Last evening, three of us went out, and we took, I'm paraphrasing here, we brought home 60 young birds. This is Aldo Leopold's father in 1878, going out to Kansas and, and Nebraska, having a day shooting prairie chickens, 60 birds, which was not an unusual take at that time in history. We'll talk about that in a little bit, how prairie chickens were proliferating in that first wave after settlement broke the prairie. This is the first thing I read. And it just struck me. This is where it begins. This is the story of American conservation in a nutshell. Of at a time when there was no conservation movement. And Alvin Leopold's father is watching good going to watch firsthand the depletion of a lot of wildlife species. So that's where we begin. But now I'm going to jump right ahead. I'm going to leave out all the stuff about Leopold's early life and career, going to the Southwest and starting the first wilderness area and doing all kinds of amazing work even before he got to Wisconsin. But now we're in 1924, and Aldo Leopold has moved from Albuquerque to Madison. This is how Leopold got to Wisconsin. He was there to work at what's called the Forest Products Laboratory. It's still there. It's part of the U.S. Forest Service. But while he was there, he began to focus a lot more on what was his real love as a conservationist, which is wildlife management. But he wouldn't use that word because the word wildlife wasn't being used yet. This says, Ted New Developments in American Game Management. Leopold was starting to cre create this brand new field. You can come forward if you want to see these. I'm going to keep encouraging you. So. <coughs> And these years of the late 1920s are really key years in the origins of modern wildlife conservation. So you'll see it, and I'll read some of this for you so you know. This is another project Leopold got involved in, to create the first national policy on wildlife. He was in charge of this committee. He was already a national figure. 
in Wildlife Conservation <coughs> Service. This key document that sets the stage for American wildlife conservation. And this is a, a phrase from it. Game conservation is at this moment in a particularly difficult stage of development. The set of ideas that serve to string out the remnants of a virgin game supply and to which many of us feel an intense personal loyalty seem to have reached the limit of their effectiveness. Something new must be done. So it was a time of revolutionary change in wildlife. And what was the new thing that had to be done? Well, they were already doing things. They were like setting up refuges here and there, nationally and at the state level, not with much planning. They were raising game on private farms and releasing game. That was the big deal back then. They were passing stricter hunting laws. But wildlife populations kept declining. Why? For the obvious reason we all know now, habitat. Loss of habitat, fragmentation of habitat. It, when I put this picture in here, I didn't know it was going to be like very realistic. <laughs> well, here's what had to happen. The one and only thing we can do to raise a crop of game is to make the environment more favorable. It's the fundamental truth the conservation movement must learn if it's up to obtain its objective. This was the revolution in a nutshell. To perpetuate and sustain wildlife populations, we have to provide habitat. And the prairie chicken, as it turns out, would be one of the absolutely most significant species in North America for this revolution to unfold. Oh, you're missing a lot of good details. You should move forward. There we go. So here's a map you see on the left of a three-year effort Aldo Leopold undertook as a one-man show starting in 1928 to do what was called the Game Survey of the North Central States. This was an unprecedented new effort to describe what was going on out there in the landscape in terms of the state of wildlife populations, and policy, and management, and there wasn't much. But Leopold did this very complete survey of the, this region of the whole upper Midwest. If you go back into that obscure book that came out of it called The Game Survey, you find prairie chickens. You find all kinds of interesting things, because it was one of the most important species to keep an eye on. I know you can't see this. <laughs> Even in the book, you can hardly read this. But it tells a story that's very clear even in the back of the room. What you're looking here is a graph. Seasons on prairie chickens. Starting in 1900, going down to 1930. The dark areas represent closed seasons. No hunting of prairie chickens. So from 1900, you saw the scattering. Oh yeah, they're hunted here and there at different times of the year. By 1930, Ohio had lost its chickens by 1900. So there was no longer relevant. Every state was closed by 1930. So Aldo Leopold in his career watched going from, you know, uh, seasons on prairie chickens throughout the region to absolutely none. That was the crisis. Then along comes this guy. I'm going to be telling stories that go back into the history of chickens and grasslands. And this becomes, this fellow becomes the first important name along with Leopold. His name is Alfred Gross. He's an ornithologist out of Maine. He teaches at Bowdoin College, a private college in Maine. And he turns out to be the most important early researcher. Why? Because he had studied grouse in New England. And he'd also studied this species, actually subspecies, the heath hen. The heath hen is the eastern version of the perch. And it went extinct in 1933. 34. This is one of the last pictures of a living heath hen. Um, and there's a story that Fran Hammerstrom actually observed while she was in, still living in Boston and was out at Martha's Vineyard where the, this population existed and observed the fire that took away the last heath hen. So it's 1928. It's the middle of all this period. This fella gets hired by the state of Wisconsin, he comes out from Maine in 1928 to do the very first 
wildlife research project done under what is now the DNR. In fact, that same year, 1928, is when the state legislature created the Wisconsin Conservation Department that becomes the DNR. So this is unprecedented. This is the first research project the new department is sponsoring. That's how important it was and how critical it was at the time. And in 1930, he publishes this report, Progress Report of the Wisconsin Prairie Chicken Investigation. 1930, one of the first important publications on the species. And again, this is difficult to read, I'll just highlight, this is from the conclusion of the book, in which he is making recommendations and talks about the need to set up refuges for prairie chickens in this region. The acquisition of land for refuges and winter feeding stations is the most important step that can be taken by the state for the conservation of the prairie game birds. 1930. So this is another uh, little bit um, about that report. And this is, uh, this is from Leopold's own work, actually, but he's describing how significant this early study was. The prairie chicken investigation it's imperative that the research bureau of the DNR add to its staff of field men to secure definite information on native game problems. So it wasn't only about the prairie chickens. This was the precedent for all of the research on wildlife in the DNR. It was the species that you're all focused on here. There's a lot of work going on. It turns out these couple years of the early 30s are really critical. Here's another, here's another article. This is Wallace Grange as a young guy. Handsome young dude. 1931. This comes from Aldo Leopold's library, The Future of the Prairie Chicken. So here's Wallace Grange working again right in this area, obviously. Some of you may have known Wallace Grange. How many knew Wallace Grange? All right. All right. So Grange, Leopold, Gross, they all know each other. Leopold himself writes an article about prairie chickens around the same time, 1931. The Prairie Chicken, a Lost Hope or an Opportunity. This is Leopold in 1931. It's a very obscure document. I haven't read this thing in decades. But I went back and reread it. You can see what's happening in those couple years, 1929, 30, 31, 32. There's this upwelling of interest by hunters, by conservationists, by bird lovers, by everybody in the fate of the prairie chicken. That's what this guy enters the story. Franklin Schmidt. This is Aldo Leopold's statement. Franklin Schmidt knew more about the life history and ecology of the prairie grouse than any living man, and as much as any living ecologist knows about any American game bird. Franklin Schmidt is a fascinating and ultimately tragic story. Schmidt is a young fellow from Illinois. His brother's a leading scientists at the Field Museum. Franklin Schmidt has already, in his 20s, gone off and do really fascinating field work all over the world. But he comes back, he becomes a student at the UW, he's taken on as a field assistant for that older, older scientist, Gross. He comes aboard, then the Depression hits, right? Funding runs out. But Aldo Leopold becomes a professor at the UW and makes him his first graduate student. So this is 1932, prairie chicken courtship. You know, this fella is doing some of the most original research, detailed research on the prairie chicken right here. I don't know exactly the spot where he was based. This, that would be a great project to figure out for everyone in this room to figure out because it's an amazing story. So he's off, and Leopold describes in detail how hard this young guy worked. This is a manuscript in which this fellow Schmidt describes trying to artificially propagate prairie chickens by putting eggs in incubators. A year after, a lot is happening in these years. It's 1933. Aldo Leopold publishes the first textbook in wildlife management, Game Management. For 40 years, this would be the book you would use if you were studying wildlife. And you go dip in there. There's a lot of prairie chickens. And it's all referencing the work of these two gentlemen, colleagues. Gross and Schmidt tell me they found both the pinnated, that's a prairie chicken, and sharp-tailed grouse in Wisconsin. And boy, do I got to 
do my editing. I didn't sleep last night, you can tell. <laughs> Nesting in at least half a mile from drinking water. Gross found 93 plants and 99 animals and 39 Pinnated and sharp tailed grouse in Wisconsin. Schmidt is quite sure that pinnated grouse in central Wisconsin eat corn earlier in the winter than sharp tailed grouse did. It's chock full of these kind of detailed biological observations. Leopold is now at the university. 1933, he joins the University of Wisconsin. <coughs> There's Art Hawkins. Come over here. This fella here is Art Hawkins, a wonderful gentleman. And right over here, you can pick up the first collection of letters from Art Hawkins to Leopold. Right over here. You're in the hot spot right now. Here's some others. These are other students that Leopold took on. This work with Schmidt in particular was important because Schmidt was his first graduate student. And it would become important for not only the chicken. It's, a, it's the mating call. <laughs> 1934, Aldo Leopold publishes another obscure article called The Wisconsin River Marshes. This is the map from that article. And it shows you places that you're well familiar with here, but as they existed in 1933 and 34, when it was a time of crisis, drought, fire burning in the wetlands and in the bogs, wildlife depleted, soil erosion, especially wind erosion in this area. Leopold and many other people, both statewide and nationally, were trying to figure out what was going to happen in this region that was destitute, impoverished, and environmentally in crisis. So you see the beginnings here of Nisida, and the Sandhill Refuge, and all the other protected places as they began to think about how do we get this area back on its feet? <laughs> and Schmidt's work becomes fundamental through Leopold. This is really hard to see, but I love this. And if you want to move up, you can see it a little bit. This is one of Leopold's class handouts. He used to hand out these little graphics to his students to explain what was going on in the Wisconsin landscape. This one shows Central Wisconsin Marshes, 1840, 1870, 1890, 1938. What kind of Animals and plants can be found at these different stages of the landscape changing through all the human impacts since European settlement. This is how Leopold taught. He taught his students how to read the landscape. And in here, you will see prairie chickens coming in here and here. So Leopold is tuning in to the history of this landscape right here. Again, it's a busy, busy time. Another thing going on at the same time, 1934, June 1934. Dedication of the University of Wisconsin Arboretum. And the very first anywhere experiments in prairie restoration. This is where it begins. 1934, and they're just kind of figuring out how to even get plants to grow. Oh, what's this new idea about burning? What? I thought fire was horrible and destructive. Oh, you have to burn to perpetuate grasslands. A revolution. Another revolution. It's when Leopold, of course, was playing out on his own landscape. In 1935, the next January, he purchases 80 acres, not very attractive, along the Wisconsin River, just west of Portage. That's pretty much what it looked like. It was devastating after 60, 70 years of farming was depleted. Sandy, sandy soil, nothing much left, nothing much growing, but it becomes the family's project of doing restoration, particularly of the prairie in Savannah, there, 1935. So this, now we're getting into the beginnings of Aldo Leopold's thinking he should be writing about all this, right? And then right after that, 1935, in that same summer, Leopold is actually away in Europe at the time on a research fellowship, but he gets the news in Germany that his student Franklin Schmidt has just died at the age of 34 in a fire here. And it's a huge tragedy because this was one of the most talented young researchers anywhere in the country. 
he loses his life, we also lose his manuscripts, his notes, his photographs, his records. He had seven manuscripts on prairie chickens in the works. They're all lost in that fire. So Leopold is devastated as his advisor and writes an obituary uh, that's very moving. I haven't read this in many years. I reread it last night. It's very poignant. Leopold in a senior position mourning uh, the loss of his student. And I'll read this for you because it's just a couple passages that, that illustrate this a little bit. Schmidt's particular hobby was the marsh region of central Wisconsin, that waif of the slums of exploitation. Long since cast out as an economic ne'er-do-well, but now the object of uplift by many conservation bureaus, if and when the intimate loveliness of those waters, those wastes, is duly appreciated and restored, the mechanism of restoration will be set upon foundations of ecological understanding built in large part by Schmidt. This is a fellow who we don't think about much. He lost his life early, he's much forgotten, but it's fundamental to what happened here. And I won't read this. If you want to read it, you can read it while I'm just describing it, um, paraphrasing here. Schmidt was known to be a very abstemious guy, a teetotaler, he never drank. He's very self-disciplined and, and simple living guy. He would spend months out in the sticks on his own, doing his research and never be seen. Then he'd come in at the end of the summer and clean up and go back to Madison. He tells a story here about Schmitz advocating for reflooding some of the drained marshes. And apparently, some people in this area bet Schmidt and said they would do it if he would drink some whiskey. Knowing his abstemious habits, they thought this a safe reply. But Schmidt promptly gulped the whiskey, and within a few weeks, the dam was built and had ducks in it. <laughs> This is how we used to do conservation in the old days. I heard a, just a rumor yesterday um, from my friend Stan Temple that there's someone working on a biography of this young man. So you got a future speaker ready to come here at some point and share his story with you. It's after Schmidt that the Heimerstroms enter the story. He passes on and the torch gets passed on to this amazing young couple and come out from the east to study wildlife and ended up in Leopold's lab in Madison. So here is a little bit of from one of Fred's early reports, breeding mechanism of prairie grouse, and he describes you know, the booming uh, behavior that we all now know so well, but it was not so well and certainly wasn't studied back then. And a little, just a little bit of a tangent here. These are in the same time, in the same area, even as the prairie chicken work is going on, there's also this other species, very rare. Nobody knows anything about it. You hardly see any. Aldo Leopold saw his first one in 1934 on the Endeavor Marsh. When you come up there from, and you go by Endeavor on Highway 51 and you look off to the west, you see that big open, what is now a muck farm? Endeavor Marsh. That's where Aldo Leopold saw his first sand hill crane in 1934. So, Hammerstrom's, along with several others, in 1936 and 38, publishing the very first scientific reports on sandhill cranes. Again, from central Wisconsin. And right after that, in 1937, Leopold publishes an essay called Marshland Elegy. Okay, here's the show and tell again. Ready? Here we go. All right, there. <laughs> Special edition of the essay Marshland Elegy. And here's the key talking point on this historic moment. Marshland Elegy is the second essay Aldo Leopold writes that would ultimately end up in St. Calico. He's 50 years old. And he's just starting to write this more poetic type of writing that the world would become so appreciative of, and this region would become known around the world for Leopold's writing. So a lot is happening here in the 1930s. Leopold publishes Marshland Elegy, and that begins... This, this letter, which you can't read unless you're up front here. <laughs> O.J. Grammy, that's Owen Grammy. Owen Grammy, I think he was then where, yeah, he was working at the Milwaukee Public Museum. He reads Aldo Leopold's essay about cranes. He writes a letter to Aldo Leopold and says, there is no sound in this world like the sandhill crane. 
and you have captured that in your essay. So this encouragement of Aldo Leopold to keep writing becomes now kind of the foundation for what ultimately becomes his famous book, The San County Olmec. Now a, little, a few more tangents, and that is into the kind of other part of my title, which is about grasslands, prairies and other grasslands, and the idea that we should be paying attention to them. They were the, they talk about neglected waif, they were the forgotten ecosystem, right? We'd watched the North Woods go down in the 18, late 1800s, and early. everyone's concerned with forests. Wetlands, at least the hunters and sportsmen who cared about draining wetlands, but prairies were forgotten. They were only good for converting to agriculture. Even the bad grasslands, bad soils, you know. Well, that begins to change, especially in the Dust Bowl years as we begin to understand how critical it is to protect our soils. So Leopold's involved in that. I'll just touch on a couple. This is out in an area called area called Fayville Grove. This is like halfway between Madison and Milwaukee, where Leopold begins to work with a group of farmers, and students are involved, and they begin to, it's Fayville Grove Wildlife Area, this little area along the Crawfish River, one of the most valuable little prairies left in Wisconsin. And this farmer, his name is Stoughton Fayville. They don't name farmers like that anymore. Story of Wisconsin's last remaining virgin prairie linked inescapably to the tale of a state patriarch. This guy, Stoughton Favell, was one of the most well-respected and well-known dairymen in Wisconsin. He was at the very peak of the whole dairy industry as it became so dominant in Wisconsin history. But he had a passion for prairies and for Indian artifacts. This is right near Ascalon just down the road from where Ascalon, if you know that historic site. So every time he plows, he's turning up artifacts, and he's keeping them collectively. He becomes a good friend of Leopold, and because of that connection, that prairie is still, still there. It's still one of the most valuable prairies we have. You can go and visit it. Madison Audubon is very involved in that particular project. And this begins then, this the emergence of the theme of protecting prairie in Leopold's work. It started back there in the Arboretum and even before that, but now, here's 1942, the prairie, the forgotten flora, the poor forgotten flora. So Leopold describes in this and many other writings why we must preserve this characteristic ecosystem of the American mid-continent. Grading, of course, into savannas, burrows and savannas, and, and so forth. So Leopold is going to write much more about the value of these heretofore less valued parts of the landscape. Now, jump ahead right now to 1948. This is April 14. This is a letter dated April 14, so tomorrow's the anniversary. 1940. This is a letter from Oxford University Press to now Dr. Leopold. He wasn't really a doctor, he never had a PhD, because it didn't, the field he created didn't exist yet. It gives me great pleasure, this letter says, to say that we are accepting your manuscript for publication. This is the uh, letter of acceptance of a San County Almanac. Although, footnote, Leopold never knew the name of San County Almanac. Because he died in the interim. This book that he's so obviously well identified with. He never knew the title. It's his son who gave it that title. Leopold dies a week later after that acceptance letter. But he died knowing that his book would be published. And it says, of course, here, Professor Leopold burned fighting grass blades. So, um, the neighbor farmer had a trash fire go in and escaped and began to work its way toward Leopold's shack. So it's a poignant end. And, of course, the book would carry on Leopold's legacy and would tell these stories to the whole world. But the story of the prairie chicken and the legacy didn't stop there. So I'll, I'll kind of work toward the end here by talking about what happened after Leopold and a few updates. So, 1957, Fred Hammerstrom, Oswald Madsen, Francis Hammerstrom, A Guide to Prairie Chicken Management. This was the culminating document of all that other work that had gone on before. And you see the names there. You see, you see Leopold, you see Gross, there's Franklin Schmidt, there's the Hammerstroms. 
it all gets folded into this summary technical bulletin in 1957. <clears throat> and all that we know about prairie chickens, basically, they, all that they knew at that time gets poured into this particular report. And you can see here, going back, remember where I started this whole talk with Aldo Leopold's father going out into Kansas and shooting 60 chickens? It's because, many of you know this story, prairie chickens exploded after the tearing up of the prairie. The release of that biotic energy into the prairie chicken population, that's what happened here too. 1875 to 1920 in Wisconsin. Original range, but it spreads north after deforestation. And then it begins to get fragmented, <coughs> declining as hunt, there's no hunting regulations. And by, you know, here's the future, question mark. In 1957, there was no understanding of what was going to happen. But at least they had the science now to help with that. But that's a pretty dramatic change that you could see in one human lifetime. Here's the map from that report. Look where we are. <laughs> you're in the epicenter. You're in the hot spot. Right here. This was where, if we were going just like the Sandhill Crane, it's almost exactly coincident with the Sandhill Crane population, except for another little one up here. But Sandhill Cranes were able to grow out of this and ripple out and reclaim all of Wisconsin and beyond. Hasn't happened with the prairie chicken for reasons that you can all kind of guess. But at the end of that report, the very end of that report in 1957, here's what the Hammer Strums said, basically. It's well known that there's been an enormous reduction over the last 50 to 100 years. These losses are still going on. I'll just again skip through this, but without exception, these records of dwindling populations are directly related to the loss of habitat, specifically to loss of grassland. So, think of the arc of this from Leopold saying, we've got to do something new for wildlife. That new thing is to provide habitat. Now we see, if you don't have the grassland, you're not going to have the birds. Which leads me now to the last part of this talk. Then I'll just update by going to three places in Wisconsin. This is from the DNR. These are areas designated by the DNR to focus particularly on working with landowners, public lands, anyone who wants to cooperate, in trying to bring back grasslands. Over there in the northwest, here in the central area, there along the Kettle Moraine, down here in the Driftless area. This is one that isn't quite within it, but this is what we're doing in our own backyard at the Leopold Foundation. I'll go the, through this pretty quickly. The stretch of river between Baraboo and Portage is the focus for this project uh, called the Leopold Pine Island and Portage Bird Area. This is an area where you can come and see 10,000 cranes from all over this region going down before they migrate on the way. They stay and hang out on these sandbars. It's an amazing thing to see. There's the river. Here's Portage down here. Here's the Leopold Shack right here. So this has been a focus of a whole big scale project where we've, with our colleagues, monitored and mapped out the populations of different grassland birds, priority species of habitats, and the birds that use them, with the ultimate goal of trying to, at this larger scale, restore grassland. <coughs> You can almost see this, even if you're in the back. <laughs> you can see it was this floodplain forest, very, very thick. And then in the last few years, if you come down and visit us, you'll see this opened up to try to encourage these species of grassland birds that we are losing more than any other suite of wild birds in the Midwest. Here's a second example. This is one I am intimately familiar with because I've been stuck in this story for 20 years. <laughs> If you drove from south from the Dells or Baraboo to Madison, you would have passed by the old Badger Army Ammunition Plant, the 7,500-acre military facility at the northern edge of what was the Sauk Prairie. 14,000 acres of prairie. It was the largest grassland along the Wisconsin River if you're coming over from Portage and the Great Lakes, right? Badger plant built in World War II basically uh, took over 80 farms that were built out of the original Sauk Prairie. Sauk Prairie did not last long after European settlement. Between 1840 and 1870, it was plowed up. All 14,000 acres. There's hardly a remnant left. There's a little bit. The 
farms that were built there. This is actually looking from the Baraboo Hills. You're kind of right behind you is Devil's Lake, known as Daywalk and Chunk by the Ho Chunk. I always say that. You're looking down to the Wisconsin River. This is Ferry Bluff down here. It's bare, it's bare cropland. It's richest soil in Wisconsin. Almost all the prairies gone. 1942, the U.S. government comes in, takes over 80 farms, converts it to the Badger plant. It stays online through Korea, Vietnam, through the Cold War. These are the original farmsteads. Original farmsteads here. here. To build that. 10,000 people work there. If your family goes back in its generations in Wisconsin, you probably had a relative who worked there. And that's what it looked like circa 1997 or 8, 20 years ago, when me and my colleagues and neighbors started working on this and made the case that this would be a great opportunity to restore prairie on the Sauk Prairie. The Baraboo Hills in the background are the most visited state park in the Midwest, right over the ridge line. And against all odds, we were able to pull together this group of people to actually create a vision for this spot. It still looks pretty rough around the edges if you come to visit us, but we are working very actively with the Ho-Chunka Nation, with the DNR, and with the USDA to do this. This is the not way the land got divided, the Ho-Chunk the state of Wisconsin and the dairy, what's called the Dairy Forage Research Center, part of the USDA. And we try as hard as we can to have as much fun as possible while we do this. It's not always fun, but we do make a time out. So we've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people involved in this project to bring back a prairie and to take care of the remnants. This is the last little remnant on the plant. It's going to be called the Hillside Prairie. It was never plowed. We're trying to use that as a focal point, as a demonstration, as a highlight. We used to have that little sign there. Yeah. 15 acre restoration in progress since 2006 by the Sauk Prairie Conservation Alliance. 5,000 acres to go. <laughs> Got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> and the last peak place I'll mention um, is if you're heading off down to the southwest toward Dubuque, Iowa, and you go past West Madison, you go down to Mount. Horeb and Boston, uh, uh, Mount Horeb on the way to Dodgeville, go pass by this region. Here's Highway 18, this portion of uh, southwestern Wisconsin, where uh, the Military Ridge Project is going on to restore prairie in this part of Wisconsin's landscape. And the main point I want to make in these little case studies is to say it's the birds that have been driving it in most cases. It's grassland birds driving the restoration vision. So down there, all these species, bobolinks and meadowlarks, and henslow sparrows and upland sandpipers, all these grassland birds that we have seen declining dramatically over the last two generations, largely due to the intensification of agriculture. We can create new ways for grassland birds and agriculture to coexist. There's amazingly interesting research going on all the time, more than ever. There's so much potential. But in these larger scale landscapes, including the one in this area, it's the birds, it's the birds that have always driven this, going all the way back to the prairie chicken, and Alfred Gross, and Aldo Leopold, and Franklin Schmidt, and the Hammersterns, and all these other amazing people. We now know, too, that you can't just do it by focusing on the birds. You do have to focus on the people, too. You have to every bit devote yourself to how to get people to cooperate and come together to share those visions and to help them bring them to being. So we now know how these birds, and it happened exactly this way at Badger. Maybe I'll tell you a 30 second story. Right outside Devil's Lake, there's a place called the Sky High Orchard. Apple Orchard. How many of you been to Sky High Orchard? There you go. It's really well known. People love it. It's a great place to visit in the fall. Members. The owner is a woman named Betty Thiessen. She's now retired. She was part of that committee we were all on to try to figure out how, what to do with the badger plant. She lives right over the hill. At one point, my friend Mike Mossman, who some of you in the room know, Mike, one of our premier field biologists, had described his first birds interviews. And he showed that this 
awful looking landscape of old buildings thrown up in World War II that were never meant to last and they've got asbestos and lead paint and this pollution and contamination in the groundwater in this horrible place. Badger is one of the best places in the whole state of Wisconsin for grassland birds, especially species like meadowlarks. So in the middle of the meeting, Betty's listening to this shit and she stops and looks at all of us. She says, that's where my metal larks went. <laughs> She'd grown up as a kid seeing metal larks, which was a common occurrence, but they no longer occurred on her own place. She's, they moved all the way down the hill. Well, that's not quite how it happened, but the point was that that was what motivated her to say, we've got to get this place back into prairie so that we can keep our metal larks. If it were here, it would be prairie chickens. <coughs> So I'll end up with this little slide of Aldo Leopold, which I, one of my favorite all-time pictures of Leopold. This is not up here. This is out southwest of Madison, in a place called Riley, where Leopold was working with farmers to encourage them to adopt some new ways of farming that would encourage wildlife on the farm, particularly birds. Not just game birds, but all kinds of, of uh, other wildlife. And it becomes important because that becomes the model for how Leopold thought we needed to do this work going forward. We're not going to own public land everywhere, and we maybe shouldn't. But we can always have these opportunities of working together, no matter who shares the landscape, to bring people together. And that's the last quote. It goes back to that game policy in 1930. And I'll tell you why I chose this quote. No game program can commend the goodwill or funds necessary to success without harmonious cooperation between sportsmen and other mm -hmm. conservationists. To this end, sportsmen must recognize conservation as one integral whole, of which game restoration is only a part. And the reason I chose that is because this is early in Leopold's career, and he is working very hard to be a diplomat between hunters, landowners, bird watchers, sometimes anti-hunters, legislators, Students, everybody, and he's trying to get folks to say we need to work together no matter what our different take on the things we value. And the prairie chicken becomes one of the great examples, right? Hunters were interested in it as a game bird, but everybody was interested in it as a species. And that's what allowed this population here that you all are so devoted to celebrating, what allowed it to sustain itself along with all those hardworking researchers and citizens who contributed. So, that's a lot of stuff, that's a lot of story. I told a lot of history here, and there's a lot of people in this room who knew some of these people and uh, shared some of this history. So, I just want to thank you again for all the work you're doing, and um, if you have any questions, and if we have time, I'd be more than happy to answer them. If not, five minutes, we've got five minutes, then I can eat the rest of my dessert. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, and one last footnote. I, I, I'm a, the world's worst mark, self-marketer, but I have four copies of my biography of Aldo Leopold. If anyone wants copies, if I sell all four of them, one quarter of the proceeds go to the Hammerstrom Writing Program. Right over there. So if you want to pitch in, he's awesome. Any questions? Thank you. Questions? Comments? Yes? Who came up with the term booming? That's a great question. And I, be, I was starting to think about that, and I don't know the definitive answer to it. Maybe someone here does, but I think it does go back. You see that term used in some of these earlier documents in the 1930s. The Hammerstrom certainly were using the term. So we'd have to go back and dig around a little bit, but that's a great, I'm imagining that, oh, oh. It, it is in Gross's book. There you go. His, uh, so maybe adapted from grouse, not from over grass. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Good question. Next by next year there will be an answer. Okay. Yeah. In the very end of this, how um vehicles uh collect figures on research on how many animals with with far less researchers than we would have today. 
I didn't quite ca catch volume, just ask. I can interpret. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, with so few people researching prairie chickens, how, how did they collect enough numbers to be able to get you know, statistically meaningful stuff to work with? They didn't until those first researchers were out there, especially at the population level. They could do the studies of the birds you know, in intimate ways to figure out behavior and all that, but the population ecology was still a big, a big black box. Nobody knew, but it was that those early researchers, particularly Schmidt, who did the first population level studies. Until then, it was just making your best informed guess. And that was common in the 1930s with almost every other species of interest because there was no protocol except for a few species. Gross becomes important because he's an ornithologist, primarily, studying ruffed grouse. And so he'd already done kind of groundbreaking work on that species. And there were a couple other examples in the country. But it was not until the 1930s that Leopold, his students, and a few others around the country began to do the first population level studies. Yeah. That slide uh, where he was talking to the farmers, I think yeah. you said it was Riley. Yeah. So what was he promoting agriculturally and yeah. was that in direct conflict with what was pro uh, the beginning of production agriculture and what they're promoting at the university? Great question, and do we have another hour? <laughs> uh, the short answer to this is Leopold had brought together a group of sportsmen from Madison in the city, in the city, to work together with a group of about eight or ten farmers to promote these new ideas of wildlife management on the farm. These town people would contribute some funds and support and labor, and the farmers would try to work together to promote new techniques. Leopold had students embedded to study the success of doing this. This was part of a, a series of projects Leopold worked on of cooperative conservation projects. There was another one out in Coon Valley, out by La Crosse. There was the one at Fable Grove I mentioned. So it was a new way of saying we need to be able to work together with farmers and landowners. Was there a conflict? Well, put yourself back in the 30s, in the Depression, in the Dust Bowl years, when agriculture was in crisis every bit as much as wildlife was. And so Leopold's whole mission was to try to say, we got common ground here. And this area, again, is part of that story because the farmers in this region were impoverished. And the New Deal was trying, trying to relocate and try to find ways to reduce the economic costs and um, relocate farmers to help them to try to make a better living. And it was very controversial, you can imagine. But it was a crisis. And so the shared concerns overweighed whatever conflicts there might have been. And on, the last word I'll say on that is that Leopold also thought, as part of his kind of campaign at the time, was to say, farmers can raise another crop. They can raise wildlife. And if we can get the hunters to support that, and if hunters can pay, that, or the public at large can also pay, to a bird watch or whatever, there may be another economic opportunity here for farmers. You know, that optimistic period of the 1930s fades into World War II, global crisis. After World War II, the gates are open in terms of agriculture and its dominance on the landscape. So we're looking back at kind of a, a moment that passed pretty quickly, but we all know we have to find a way to get back toward it somehow. And it's not just wildlife, it's carbon sequestration, and it's water, and it's all the other things we value on the landscape, especially of where private lands I will stick around for a little bit if you want to chat more, but thanks so much again and enjoy the rest of the day.